What does sueñito mean? Sueñito? It means little dream. That's it? No story? All right, all right, everybody sit down, sit down. It's a story of a block that was disappearing. In un barrio called Washington Heights. The streets were made of music. On these blocks, you can't walk two steps without bumping into someone's big plan. I've been saving up all my pennies in my piggy bank for this day. This is going to be an emotional roller coaster. The odds are against you. But there's a chance, right? In the Heights, John M. Chu's anticipated motion picture, based on Lin-Manuel Miranda's stage musical, has arrived in theaters after a one-year delay due to the pandemic. It features an ensemble cast led by Anthony Ramos as bodega owner Uznavi, and it's set in the New York neighborhood of Washington Heights. Joining us on this episode of Behind the Screen are the film's supervising sound editor and re-recording mixer, Louis Goldstein, who's been Emmy-nominated for Russian Doll. Production sound mixer, Drew Cunion, who was nominated for Oscars three times, including earlier this year for Mank, and editor Myron Kirstein, who previously worked with Chu on Crazy Rich Asians. I'm Carolyn Giardino. Welcome to The Hollywood Reporter's Behind the Screen. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Hello. Hi. Hello. So let's get started. In the Heights was filmed on location in Washington Heights, as well as on stage in New York. Lou, why don't you start the conversation by describing how you work together with everyone on the sound team, uh, with Myron, whose cutting room was also in New York, as well as with John Chu. Well, I got involved pretty early on and and started watching, uh, I think it was Myron's idea, to start watching the cut very, very early. And, and it's really long form. And Myron had a, uh, his cutting room wasn't very far from where my sound facility is. And Mar- Myron really had an, a wonderful sound setup in his cutting room, 5.1. So um, I was able to actually watch some of the very early versions of the film as Myron was really kind of prepping it out sound wise with the full music and, and, and voice and all. So pretty early I started seeing where the film was going and where Myron and John we're starting to take it. And I think we did that quite a bit. Uh, even before I started, you know, physically working on the film, I would get a call going like, yeah, the boys would like you to see the film again. So I would go back to the cutting room. <laughs> and wh- I that actually... Was like a, that was every other day, I think. It, it was, like. <laughs> it was, you know, it was... And it's funny because I remember things. I remember scenes and stuff very early on in the film. And I watch it now and it's it's... Uh, final form and things flash at me. It's like, oh, I remember when, you know. Um, but I think as, as a, a film goes, and I've worked on quite a few, I've seen this one more top to bottom than any film I've ever worked on. Which the funny thing is, is I've never lost sight of the film and it's I, I've enjoyed it every single time that I've seen it from top to bottom. But it really gave me a very good... Uh, working vocabulary of of what Myron and John were doing every single day, you know, and how they were structuring the film. Myron, you're nodding. Do you want to add to that? Yeah, no, it was, it was really important to uh, create that, um, that dialogue um, right away because, you know, John and I really wanted the film to feel grounded and sound, not just the music, but the, the, the sound effects, the Foley, you know, the way we were mixing the vocals like dialogue was going to be really difficult. And to get Lou on the same page early on really made a huge difference. And, you know, he, he mentioned 5-1. And for anybody who's listening, it's it's basically I have five speakers in my room. So I have, I have three up front and then two in the back. And it really allows me to approximate what it sounds like in a movie theater. 
And that w- so I was able to put depth into my cutting room um, the way you would hear it in a, in, a, um, in a theater. And so I could, I could, you know, Lou was so patient with me. It was like, you know, it was like me, you know, a kid in the candy store, you know, say, look at what I did. And it's like, yeah, yeah, you put it in the room. And, uh, but, it, but it was actually, it was very, you know, it was, it was really important that like, I think Myron mentioned about the, the relationship between the dialogue and the singing in this film. And, you know, the singing in this film aren't just songs. They're actually dialogue of story that's going on that are vital. You know, you can't just cut a song down and make it shorter because you would lose very important story points. So Myron was getting a really good handle on, you know, how the vocals, even the early vocals were going to fit with the quote unquote, you know, speaking parts. So, you know, that concept and how they were going to work together and how they were going to go in and out of each other was being, you know, thought about and worked on very early on in the cutting room. So let's talk about the songs. Drew, why don't you get started? Um, I know some of the songs were recorded live during production. Others were recorded separately. Tell us about recording the music. Well, I mean, all the songs were recorded live at some level. And we, we almost every one, we had, um, uh, you know, the backing tracks were pre-recorded, but the vocals, we had the ability to record live. And we set up with that in mind that there would be um, a portion of it that would play live. And a lot of the songs, because of uh, how they're written, aren't purely just songs. They have breaks in the middle where they go back to talking or there's some rap that where you really need it to be, have that, that, that the feeling of being live. That stuff's harder to do, do playback uh, rapping. It just feels much better when it's live recording. And so you could intersperse live and um, and the pre-records. So we were set up to do that all the time. And, and oftentimes we would start doing one way and then segue to the other. Like we would begin with a full playback. And then once they felt, John felt like they were really in the groove, he would say like, okay, let's go live now and let's do live versions. And then we would sometimes finish with all live versions. And, and it would end up in the final film. It's a hybrid. I mean, almost as, as Lou was saying, almost every song has got an element of live recording in it where they're, you know, sometimes it's, it's it's a big piece. Sometimes some of them began fully live, like acapella live, or the, like the openings of I don't know. Uh, it Carnival of Ario starts live, and then it it say you know it it transforms into being a giant uh, you know carnival. Yeah, but even Carnival, which is really one of my favorite songs in the film, uh, that never stays in one direction or the other. You know, it starts out with very live singing and goes into some recordings, and then kind of goes back into some of Drew's production again, and then goes back into some studio recordings. So it was really about the pieces that had the best energy and, 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 and then you have, you know, you have some numbers like when you're home, you know, which is Benny and Nina at the park, which is essentially just her acapella and beautifully done. And, you know, John was even, you know, hesitant about when he should even put in the backing tracks. (laughs) He was like, (laughs) Yeah, you know, maybe we maybe we should wait halfway through the song to put the backing track. <laughs> well, the first time, the very first you know? time we did her singing a cappella, because I, I think that was we had a thing. They gave her some pitch, but we gave her an earwig, and and you know, and they, he played live keyboard in her ear to give her something to go with to begin. And then, but the first time we did it, where she sang live, you know, she did some rehearsals, but it was fine. And then when she really sang live, we all got goosebumps. It was just chills. She was her voice was so beautiful, and I say John was just giddy he was so happy like like, she because she was you know you know she's a professional singer but she's more of a pop star and she's a great you know she's a great pop star but she to see her handle that the way she did and have realized the quality the beauty of her voice uh was really uh stunning for us all and and it you know as you say he wanted he kept wanting to do more and more he was like well let's just have her sing all the way through which we did but you know there's there is a lot of other stuff that goes on there
Drew, would you elaborate on recording the songs um, live on location? Um, because there must have been, you know, so, I mean, just the sounds of New York must have been challenging locations. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That, you know, the park was a challenging location. These are all, almost everything was done in real locations. The one big studio set piece is the, uh, when the sun goes down, which was done on a, a stage, but almost all the interiors were, a lot of the interiors, I think most of them were done in real places. The song Champagne, which was all live and was always decided to be live, it's, it's hard, I think, when you're watching it for people to realize how difficult that was to shoot and choreograph because you see it's in a sm very small real apartment. There was no room anywhere for anything in the apartment. We were all outside. I had uh, antennas. I was... And you see out the windows, both front and back of the apartment. So I was right below the window with antennas up, sort of set up on either side of the, right at the edge of the window frame, so pointing back to try and reach the back of the apartment. But I had to reach all the way through in there. You know, they, the camera is handheld, or sort of what they call bungee cam, where he's, it's almost like a steady cam. And he goes from the front room to the back room, to the, to the kitchen, out to the front room again, and they spin around. There's nowhere for anyone to be. Other than, and it was a, a very choreographed dance. There was a boom in the room and he got some stuff that was pretty great to have that mic there. But there were times when he got pinned and he couldn't get out of a room and get into the other room until the camera turned again. So I would have to cover him. It was very just complex. Just, just to break this down for one second, you know, just this is a one -er. This is a musical yeah. number that's a one -er. So that yeah. means there's no edits. This is my best editing, I jokingly say, <laughs> in, the, in the whole movie. Um, this is a one -er that's also recording two people live and you have to make it sound good enough to actually play in a movie <laughs> theater. Actually play in a movie theater. Yeah, no, it was, it was very, it was very uh, challenging to do because of the way it was shot and choreographed. It is a one shot thing. Like you don't have, there's no uh, over, you know, you don't have a second take to choose from, but there, we did a good bit of rehearsing to figure it out and, and run through it. But when they finally did it, it was, it was magic. It was great and exhausting. <laughs> But then, as I say, I think we were using an example of there was, uh, and I don't even know how much we even talked about what ended up in the final film, but you know, the, the end of Blackout is a sort of the, um, it's almost like a fight. It's a very passionate scene between Vanessa and Usnavi. And they come out of the club and they, uh, uh, and they're in a sort of alleyway and it's really underneath the, the uh, elevated part of the West Side Highway. And it was like 5.30 in the morning, not even 5 in the morning. The sky was just starting to go from black to blue. And was always imagined that that was going to be, it's a, it was a terrible place to, to shoot, but it was going to be playback. We did several takes of playback. And then John was like, you know, can I hear what they sound like? I, I played him and they were amazing because they were really into it and they were phenomenal. And there was a take where they were just, their performance was astonishing. And so he was like, we have to go live. So we did then, and I was like, okay, we'll see, you know, we're in this terrible place. It's underneath the highway. And, you know, every garbage truck is rumbling by in the morning and we're running out of time because the sky's turning blue and it's going to cease to be a night scene. And um, we did a couple takes that way, one of which was just, I thought, amazing. And I don't know how much of that ended up in the film, but it was beautiful and phenomenal. It's all the steady cam that run down the alley between the garbage cans and uh, they spin around. Uh, I think I think uh, Lou was it a hybrid? Yeah, but I think it is a hybrid. I think um, a, a lot of him, uh, Yusnavi, uh, was from the live takes, and 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 I think most of her as well. But again, it's uh, yeah, I, independent. It's we, and also, a it's a blur. long, it's a long scene. It begins in the, uh, you know, it begins in the the uh, outpouring of the club and everything. So it's a lot going on. But that end bit where the two of them at the uh, right. thing, it's a a, a very un. You know, it's, it's unforgiving and, and, and not particularly uh, conducive to uh, recording music that will be in a feature film. But we ended up, I think it was, there was great. It helped that they were really, they were fantastic. Their energy carried it. Lou, do you want to elaborate on mixing that sequence? You know, I'm trying to remember that one. There were so many. <laughs> um, you know, again, it comes down to like, you know, Drew's talking how these, his recordings were done. As well as, you know, we had studio recordings from prior of the shoot and then we had studio recordings you know after the shoot and the studio recordings after the shoot we actually used uh studio microphones as well as microphones that drew would use on set so we would have um 
you know, recordings to try to match literally what was recorded on set. And the key was, which was probably my biggest contribution, was to try to make all of these uh, vocal performances and talking performances just seem embedded and seem uh, as one, you know. So uh, you're never being pulled from the dialogue, quote unquote, or songs, quote unquote, because of a difference in, you know, the sounding of a vocal performance. And, and I, I think we accomplished it quite well as far as keeping things very consistent. So a scene like that where, you know, we do have angles and pieces that were recorded by Drew that have more ambient noise than, you know, pieces that were recorded in a studio, you know, you do a combination of cleaning up the things that were recorded on set and at the same time messing up some of the stuff that were recorded in the studio. So, you know, you try to, at an even consistency, uh, you can just so, you can just clean up noisy recording so much. So sometimes you actually have to dirty up the opposite part and, and then kind of smooth them together. There was an amazing, it's an incredible number is, is, and I think in some ways it's like the heart of the film is, uh, Abuela Claudia's, uh, Paciencia y Fe. First of all, it's Olga Minerides. She she played Abuela Claudia every performance on Broadway. I think like twelve hundred performances on Broadway. She sang that role, and then where Abuela Claudia is coming up the the subway, and she's in that elevated subway uh, line on one hundred and thirty fifth, and it's it was it was very hot and dismal, and there was traffic backed up everywhere. Like there was a full traffic jam everywhere you looked, and people honking and all that. But it was kind of great because it was the sound of the hottest day of the year in New York and we were actually shooting it and it was boiling hot and it was dirty and there's all this background in that stuff. And then she starts singing. And I think that that beginning also played with her live with all that background because it's the real place. And then as this, it becomes into her fantasy, you lose a lot of it. And, there's, you know, there's actually a lot more of her performance when she's down in the subway at the end of the song, just before she comes up out of the subway. Ah, and, right. Uh, and, and a ton of that is her on set uh, performances. She's um, amazing. <laughs> yeah, that's, you know, that's, that again, scene is amazing. I keep saying, well, that's my favorite song too. I can't think of one of them that's really not my favorite song. <laughs> my favorite song. That was my favorite song too. That one too. But yeah, that, that one has, favorite. you know, that one, she is, she carries that in such a way. It really has a lot of different perspectives from where she goes through that song and where she is both physically and, yeah. you know, emotionally until she gets to the end. And she gets to the end of that song and I cry every time. Oh. You know? Yeah. Myron, do you want to describe editing that scene? You know, it's, it's, I think that's probably the most emotional set piece in the entire movie. And um, it was from the get go, it was always, it was always going to be focusing on Olga's performance. And she was going to, you know, whatever she was doing was going to dictate, you know, how I was cutting that scene. Because, well, first of all, I do that in general, just trying to, you know, um, let performance sort of guide my way. That it's, it's sort of like my beacon. But also, you know, not to, it's it's probably the most theatrical piece as well in the entire movie. So we're li literally moving through, I call it like dioramas almost, like, uh, you know, where she's sort of floating through, you know, these frozen memories and so between her performance and just whatever captures just the essence of these memories and not getting in the way of that. In fact, that's sort of been my mantra through the entire movie is don't get in the way of the choreography. Don't get in the way of the performance. You know, don't don't overcut. But the choreography there was very amazing, too. It was very uh, uh, elaborate and interesting. And it, it was several different styles of choreography. It was Yeah. And as we move through the different decades of her life, you know, you know, just her telling the story. You know, I was trying my best to, you know, just heighten things with, you know, whether it's, you know, the dancers, you know, slamming on the side of the window or um, maybe, t you know, cutting to a um, to a dancer who is, um, you know, mimicking, you know, birds in the the plaza. You know, they were just trying to um, heighten what Olga was doing. Uh, funny enough, that scene was it's all about context <laughs> and for me generally when making a film and 
that scene was supposed to be much earlier in the movie. And at one point, um, that scene was close to being one of the scenes maybe cut out of the movie because of that. And of course, it, that was never going to happen, but we were really struggling about like how to um, make that scene work where that where should that musical number it, it it was written to be like another intro to our characters like how our other you know matriarchs were in the film but it felt like to save the best for last as and i'm not gonna put a spoiler in here but as something really dramatic was happening you know made it this really intense magical moment even more powerful Myron, in general, do you want to talk about just shaping the performances of the, of the characters? Because you had a big ensemble cast, and then you had to go in and out of the musical numbers. So how did you address the performances and allow the audience to get to know these characters? Well, somebody asked me, like, you know, did you do anything differently with this cast that you would do it with anybody else? And the, the answer is no. Like, there, every single character, every single actor was speaking their own truth the day on the set, you know, when they, you know, when they were being shot and my, you know, my role was to just, you know, find the best little kernels, these, these little gold gems that kept popping up and then craft a performance based on that. And, you know, and of course the biggest issue was that we had so many characters to be honest with you. And, um, and so there's a temptation to really cut this film down. In fact, we really tried to do that. You know, we tried a 30 minute version that was shorter and we actually tested that version and it didn't appeal to the audience any more than the longer version. So, and in fact, it felt like a less of a fuller experience. So we really felt like the ensemble of all these characters really was part of the whole gestalt of this thing. It was about community. It's not about Usnavi. It's not about Vanessa. It's not Dina or Benny. So once I got to know a character and like all their, all their wonderful, you know, nuanced things that they did, you know, to represent who they were playing, I, you know, I would just embrace it, you know, whether it was, you know, Usnavi and his charming ways. And when he broke the fourth wall and when he like winked at the audience, you know, versus like, uh, Nina with her vulnerability, um, just really like leaning into that and her frustration about <laughs> trying to do the right thing here, you know, or Vanessa, who's, you know, everyone looks at her as a pretty girl, but no, she has dreams too, you know, and Olga is just like this powerhouse who, you know, she represents the history of the show as well. So, um, yeah. you know, she's like, every person's grandmother ever. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, it's, it's all about just like crafting their truth and doing that in a way that feels like grounded and real. And sometimes we can go a little broader with it. You know, obviously we're going into magical realism in parts, but um, you know, my job was always to just keep it real, keep it moving, realize that all the domino pieces, all the characters were holding each other up as a community and try to not find any chinks in the armor. Another number I'd love to talk about is the 96,000, which was the one that was shot at the large pool. Drew, tell us about recording that one. <laughs> well, you know, finally, enough, that began with a very long tracking shot. It's a um, Steadicam shot that goes like for three blocks or a couple blocks. It was very hard for us to do in terms of just the, the throw of the microphones because the guys were all mic'd and they, that that rap was done live, it, it, it opens it, and then we, by the time we get into the pool, uh, there was a huge amount of extras, and it was uh, unfortunately that day was not as hot as it had been. Weirdly, that was the day that was not. We wanted it to be super hot, so the people were a little chilly, uh, but we played a lot of music really loud. That, so there was a place where we opted to play the playback big on speakers for everyone because you couldn't, you know, so they could dance to it. And it also just helped, you know, pump up the crowd in a big way. Uh, in a lot of places in the streets of New York, they try to dissuade you from playing playback really loud. Uh, I think there were a, a couple of times where incidents where people were shooting scenes that kept everyone up all night with loud music and they, people complained. So they tried to have us not do it as much as, you know, we used to. Uh, but there, because we were all within the high pool, uh, high bridge pool complex, we could really crank the, tunes and it was great and it helped to create the mood and the mood was amazing and it was fantastic there were all these people they did a great job of of casting background people to really make more than just our because that's the place where first of all everyone comes together the cast but also 
the whole community. There's lots of people of different ages. They had that little girl dancing who was just incredible. <laughs> Who became like she's in the trailer? She's a, a symbol of the whole thing. That was, and she was just an extra <laughs> who was just an in, incredible uh, dancer in that moment. So there was a lot of that stuff was caught, but it was hard. It was a lot of stuff to do. We didn't have that much time to do it. Uh, it got started to get dark. It was a rainstorm at one point. We had to like you know run for the uh, uh, shelter. I think they had. It felt like it was raining all the time during that time. Like, yeah, I, 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 that was one of the few times I went to set and. Um, and I was just like, how are you shooting the scene? It's raining like every 15 minutes. Like, it, rained, so- it was a rainy day. At one point it got, yeah, like a thunderstorm came and it got dark in the, you know, it wasn't even sunset yet, but it got like, I think when the, the clouds build up and it got dark and it poured on us. Wasn't it a, an, an incredible amount of extras, like 500 extras or something It was something a huge, like that? huge number. Yeah. Um, and they're, they're also, I think we did tiling where they made them even more, you know, tiling where you shoot them here and then move them over there and shoot them again and move over there and shoot them again. Uh, and then, so there were some of those sequences where it seems like there's even more uh, than there are, uh, but there were a lot of people. And I love how, like how um, bare bones stripped down, you know, the, the how you guys recorded the, and mixed, um, you know, the, the walk up to the pool, because it feels like just very raw and honest and, these guys are just like, they're so great that they can take after take. They're just like literally live, you know, rapping as they're walking down the street. As they're walking down the street, rap, walking rap, several rap, blocks down the street. Ra- yeah. Rapping and acting, you know, as they're walking down the street, you know. And then, um, but I just loved how that, how that felt. If I won the lotto tomorrow, well, I know I wouldn't bother going on no spin this free. I pick a business school and pay the entrance fee. And maybe if you're lucky, you'll stay friends with me. I'll be a businessman richer than Nina's daddy. Tiger Woods and I on the links and he's my caddy. My money's making money. I'm going from pole to modo. Keep the bling. I want the brass ring like Proto. Here goes Mr. Braggadocio. Next thing you know, you lying like Pinocchio. Oh, yo, if you scared of the bull, stay out the rodeo. Oh, I got more flows than Obi-Wan Kenobi. Oh, you better stop rapping. You not ready. It's going to get hot and heavy and you all ready. He sweat, yo, 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 I'm sorry, was that an answer? Shut up, go home and pull your damn pants up. Oh. As for you, Mr. Frodo of the Shire, what? 96 G's ain't enough to retire. Come on, I have enough to knock your ass off his axis. You'll have a knapsack full of jack after taxes. Lou mixed, mixed that number, which is just a, I mean, it, it, I, I mean I've listened to that song so many times but when i was listening to him on the stage and all the layers there's so there's many a layers. lot of layers that, that song has so many components to it and all the things that came from you know uh, just the musical tracks between what alex and bill and uh, and greg delivered on those components there's just so many little things happening and then you have you know five six layers of voices of our principles and then you have literally probably, I think we about had about a hundred tracks of background singers, and and that was the one thing about the um, this entire movie is the the background ensemble performances are incredible, and there's every one was delivered as an individual. Mostly everything was delivered as an individual component, so we had control of where these background vocals would happen. And the background vocals tell such a story themselves in what's going on in in all of these songs, especially the opening and 96,000. So it was just like layers and layers and layers to try to be managed and controlled, you know, to, to make some kind of sense out of both vocally and, you know, musically. But at the same time, it just makes it an incredibly intense performance. Uh, an impressive performance by everybody involved. So, and if I could speak to that, Caroline, do it. One other thing that I love what Lou did was like, you know, it's one thing when I'm like, oh, you know what would be great is that at this part of the number, let's go underwater. But then for him to like make it sound like we're going underwater, but build at the same time, like that's kind of a hat trick of like, you know, uh, okay, oh yeah, okay, jerk. You decided now you're gonna go underwater just as you're building, trying to build up the song, and you know, <laughs> you accomplished both really. Well, the great part of doing that was 
I mean, I think that's one of the only places in that entire performance where the, the song kind of pulls back a little bit. The whole scene just kind of pulls back for like two seconds. And then coming out of that moment is just tremendous, you know, from a, a visual point of view and from a, a sonic point of view. So it just builds this crescendo, um, which is just a lot of fun. It, it just plays and has, uh, you know, a lot of fun and it creates this perfect, you know, moment of of quiet before a burst and it's and it's also like sonny's you know mm. it's sonny's great mm -hmm. moment he he mm -hmm. bursts out of his, whole, uh, his character mm -hmm. i know and you know there's something to the all the layering of that song that's so incredible like even when i was starting to cut it and once the once usnavi uh, vanessa and benny start overlapping each other i literally had to um isolate each each of those vocals to understand like when should i cut to like when was it important to cut to a specific character because there's so much layering and overlapping that starts happening as the song builds and builds to basically include the community which i also try to do editorially and it's funny because i'm working with lynn now on his movie and i said I was like, Lynn, you know, nice success is it's got a lot of layers. He's like, yep, got a lot of layers. <laughs> like it's got, <laughs> it's so it yeah, it was just, you know, when you first hear that song, it's all kind of it's like almost like a pop song where you don't realize what is going on until you start breaking it all down and trying to make a make sense of it. For a number like that, does John give you a lot of material to work with? Yes. <laughs> yeah, they, <laughs> yeah. Uh, we shot a I lot. Mean, the footage that uh, day was. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you know, just to put it in perspective, there's sh they shot that number over three days, shooting the camera on uh, many hours of those days, and I'm I have to boil it down to you know a musical number. So there's a there's a lot of cameras going on. There's a lot of there's a lot of sections where you know like Benny crossing the pool when he first enters. You know, we're just holding on him. But then, you know, there's B cameras or C cameras, you know, just finding things, you know, and shooting, you know, the woman in dreads dancing in the shower or, or the little girl, you know, dancing with the, um, you know, pop and lock guys. So there's certain sections the way there's like just, you know, the camera's just holding on the salon ladies and we're pulling back and letting the choreographer do the moment. And I don't need to cut. And then there's other times where like, no, I want to go to um graffiti p you know spray painting the numbers or i want to go to you know the community you know saying ninety six thousand. you know i so th yes there was a lot <laughs> that i had to sort of make sense of um but you know a lot of the footage also just said okay th this is the structure i know where i'm going now how do i how do i pepper these things how do i not you know it's probably the most cutty of all the musical performances in the entire movie um so i you know i was balancing between not getting too you know i was always trying not to be too music video-y and just keep it grounded keep you know remember we're storytellers we're not making music videos and we're you know this number is about community they're telling a story they're telling about like well what are they going to do with this money if they won this you know if they have the winning lotto ticket like all that stuff was important as i was just sifting through three days of material. Would the three of you also talk about the opening number, uh, the, the title song in the Heights, because you had to introduce a lot of characters in that number. And then you had the big dance at the end. And, uh, and this was filmed on location. I, as I understand, you had about a four block radius drew where they had the straights shut down for you. You know, that song is, I mean, you guys said, is it 10 minutes? It's gotta be close to it. More. I think it's actually longer. Yeah. It's a really, really long. They just, re number. they just released the, um, the opening and it's they say it's eight minutes but it's it is actually technically a little abridged uh what we uh, released on you what we released on youtube but yeah i think it's closer to maybe 10 minutes over there wow. yeah and you know and it does end with a giant group of people you know taking over the street taking over several blocks or up on a crane but you know it also you introduce all our characters usnavi introduces us to his world and everyone in the in the bodega comes and goes and there's a lot of really intimate personal stuff, but then it ends up, you know, encompassing the whole, uh, the whole world. But it was, you know, once again, it took us a long time to shoot it. It was broken down to lots of pieces, interstitial parts. In fact, I th it took almost the, uh, the entire shoot from the yeah. beginning to the end. And then we picked up more footage uh, 
I think maybe four or five minutes, four or five months later for the community chorus. So it was, it, you know, it literally took me almost entire uh, production and post process to shoot that number. Um, uh, what I love about that number more than anything is how seamlessly we, we did it editorially, but also how Lou picked it up where we could stop on a dime and have a breath and then we could pick up the song again. So, you know, Usnavi could, you know, stop, <laughs> stop on a piece of gum and then I can cut to the beach, have a little giggle with the kids. And then we could do a record scratch and literally wind it back up and start that song again. And some of that is live. Some of it's pre-record and, you know, so on and so forth. And I, and I would say Carolyn, like, you know, the opening number is very similar to like, you know, the like 96,000, where I think we start in almost kind of like, um, you know, introducing each of these characters in a way that just feels like, uh, you know, like the narrator is just guiding us in. And little do we know we're, 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 um, we're building the community more and more over the course of that number until you have that large, big, gigantic, you know, uh, uh, finale with the, basically the entire you know the entire community together dancing their hearts out and you know i i think that that's just us guiding the audience over the course of 10 minutes <laughs> to basically like these are the rules this is how we're gonna you know don't worry we're gonna keep it grounded we're gonna have some we're gonna have some messed up fun magical realism moments and we're going to make you connect to these characters as quickly as possible think you're gonna have a fun ride and then we're gonna you know and then we're gonna wow you at the same time and we're gonna blow it out yeah because it, it ends in a total you know over I don't think it also top, introduces huge. us to washington heights at the same time i mean the whole beginning is is oh, yeah. really sets up incredibly well where we are where this is what this world is and where it takes place yeah i'm a street light choking on the heat the world spins around while I'm frozen to my seat. The people that I know I'll keep on rolling down the street. But every day is different, so I'm switching up the beat. Because my parents came with nothing. They got a little more and sure with Paul. But yo, at least we got the store. And it's all about the legacy they left with me. It's destiny. And one day I'll be on the beach with Sunny Wright and checks to me. Hang my heights, I hang my flag upon display. We came to work and to live and we got a lot in common. It reminds me that I came from miles away. talk about recording the song uh, Benny's Dispatch, which was uh, Corey Hawkins and Leslie Grace. Absolutely. Well, Benny's Dispatch was recorded in the actual booth on the corner uh, of Audubon and 165th, where we were. You know, they, that was actually, that place was a, um, was actually, I think it was a car service, but it didn't have a dispatch in a window there. That, but that's the thing that you, some places used to have. And so they built the, the little window thing in an existing window, but they built his little booth there. And we had a couple of mics planted in there. I couldn't get a boom anywhere, near him, but I had a mic there and he's, he's, he's in, he's uh, talking and I, and he had a, a body mic on him and we started it. Once again, I think that was one where there was some playback, but it became clear that he was really rhythmically, it was way better to try and get him live. It just felt really natural. Also, he was just really good. And, so we did a couple of them and then he took off, you know, and it's really fun. His delivery is so sharp. And I think it was better when he was in the character doing it. And it's a fun scene also because we go in and out of the booth. So there's a there's part that happens where she comes in. Right. And uh, uh, and so we go in and out of the booth and uh, and we go. There's some dialogue inter intermixed. But then the real flow is fantastic. And 
he was uh, um, he'd been he was really up for it. He felt like that was his big thing, and he you know he spent a while building up to it. But it I was, would I say it was great. a majority of that song is Drew's recordings, and it's probably the scene that I would wind up coming back to the most because there were different angles and different shots and different microphones and and you know a wide shot and then a close up and so you had all these different sounds from the different microphones in the different room so it really took a while to mix said oh, this, this this is all this is all flowing perfectly it all sounds like one scene and then you'd watch it back and be like Oh yeah, I got to spend a little more time on this. Yeah, you know? he goes big. He goes, it, it, you're wide. You know, you hear the room. You 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 hear it too tight. You're yeah. And he's Solid. also saying stuff, and mm -hmm. you know, what he's saying is is important and wordy, and interesting and creative. And so you'd have to make sure it was all uh, intelligible. So you're popping up syllables and you're doing little things to keep all the words and keep what he's saying, especially it's this reggaeton track, this reggaeton track that is just thumping and it's got so much low end to it and it has such a groove and then you got mm -hmm. Corey on top of it. So it just was one of those scenes that I just kept going back to and having to like, well, let's work on this a little bit more vocally and try to, and I really think where it is now and every time I see it, I'm like, all right, well, that, that seems... I, 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 I right. have to say, I have to say, I wish you, that was like one of those scenes. I wish you had mixed it before I was cutting it because it was like, it was like one of those things where it was like, are we going to make this like feel real? Like, are we going to, we're going to able to ground this to make this, you know, all feel, you know, fit together. And, you know, and also Corey and, um, Leslie were doing all these fun, fun things where they were like laughing and egging each other on. So they're doing those between lyrics and, you know, making using all that improv to, you know, kind of just make that, that number jump, you know, and then you, you, then you have Leslie just beaming in her voice with saying good morning. And it's like, it's like a lightning bolt through your heart, you know? And um, so man, what a, uh, by the way, and another musical number that was on was literally out of the movie for a while because we were like, there's too much, Nina and Benny, we needed it to be more about these characters. And in fact, the first for the first time we showed Lynn the film was without Benny and the Dispatch. He was like, so where's Benny and the Dispatch? <laughs> <laughs> like, oh yeah, we're just trying a couple things, Lynn. Don't, uh, yeah, we, we, <laughs> we'll, probably put, we'll probably put it back. But as also the case where that was that that was shot in a real location. There was no studio element of that. That was all a real on the corner that was our corner across from the bodega. You know, some of the interiors, like the interior of the beauty salon was a set that we built, uh, but that the the dispatch was shot in a glass booth right on the street corner. It's been great talking about the film with you. Thank you so much. We could talk for, about this for a long time. We love the movie. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Carolyn. Really appreciate it. Thanks very much. Last night in the hood again. 